develop strategies, et cetera. Um, and in some ways, I feel a little bit of a fraud because there's other great colleagues on the panel who will be do, actually doing co-production themselves. I think um, as I see my role, I want to ensure that it happens in terms of any work we take forward across the trust. And I've got some examples of that um, for later, but also embed it into the way I work um, with my team. So, you know, we, we have a, a small, I'd say a small, but perfectly formed CEO office team. And we work really collectively in ter terms of taking um, forward the sort of challenges that we faced um, on the last, over the last year. So I think for me, co-production means few things it's about how we deliver services it's how we develop strategies but also it, it fundamentally underpins the way we work as individuals thank you that's brilliant thank you sandy um, and now um i'm handing over to alice um, hello, lovely to be with everyone this afternoon. Um, so I'm Al Mathers and my role at Good Things Foundation, um, which is a national digital inclusion charity based in Sheffield, is looking at how we understand um, the needs and impacts around digital and ex exclusion and inclusion. And obviously the link with um, people being able to access services is increasingly around whether people can have the digital access, the skills um, and the confidence to do so. It's something that's really come to the forefront within um, the last year as a result of the pandemic. Um, Co-production is really, really key um, in my day-to-day -day work because it's how we learn, um, how we learn what the challenges are on the ground from the community partners and communities we work with and also how we liaise with both national government and local authorities to help shape inclusive services. Um, so I'm delighted to be here and part of such a diverse panel. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks Al. Um, Ed. Hello everyone, uh, my name's Ed Sexton. I am a quality and involvement officer in the People Services Portfolio in the Council. So what's that, you might reasonably ask. Um, Hopefully you know what the council is, but the, the people services portfolio, it's a, a, a big area. It used to be called a directorate. They're now portfolios. It covers a wide area of activity. So adult social care, education and skills, libraries and community services, and strategy and commissioning and children's services. So it's a very broad remit. And my um, role um, covers those areas probably less so around children's services I have a colleague who tends to cover those areas but all of the others um i've been with the council around 12 years and it's uh, the role sort of shifted quite a bit over that time um before that i had a career in the voluntary sector which actually one day i'd quite like to uh, return to uh, and that included working in and managing citizens advice bureau uh managing an advocacy project for for adults with learning disabilities um so it's quite a quite a broad remit but i would say that over probably periodically and um it, it's often been about working in and around um social care and health and specifically uh disability has been a sort of fairly regular theme in my in my working life over many years starting with welfare rights um learning disability um, and increasingly, uh, in terms of uh, colleagues within the local authority around reasonable adjustments, hidden impairments, and we're just about to renew our commitment as an organisation to disability confident. Um, we're currently at level two, which is an employer, a good employer status, and we do have ambitions to become a leader in the city, although uh, we feel we may be some way off that, but we're, lo we're looking at working with them. Um, with colleagues in the, in the council to assess where we are and to try and take that forward. So my role has changed over the years, as often does tend to happen um, in organisations like the council. Uh, it's less public facing than it used to be. I used to be more out and about doing a lot of the direct work um, myself or uh, leading a team that was doing that. Now it's more about an overseeing role. Um, and it's I, I describe it as, as sort of support and challenge in the portfolio, a bit of a critical friend, um, trying to ensure that um, we are taking into account our quality duties as an organisation and demonstrating good practice around the way we involve and engage people, including co-production. So specifically, um, we have um, duties around um, 
making sure that we're advancing equality of opportunity, eliminating discrimination and fostering good relations in respect of different protected characteristics. So that's the legal bit. And that would include age. So from a from a um, <clears throat> thinking about older people, for example, or disability or sex or race, there are legal protected characteristics that we must ensure we take into account um, as a public body. But we'd also strongly look at other interests as well within that. So even if you don't have a legal status, you're not protected in law, such as a, a carer, for example, someone with unpaid caring responsibilities, to all intents and purposes, we, we would think of an unpaid carer in similar ways when we're, when we're formulating plans or looking to involve people. Um, I suppose around equalities, one way that it comes together is something called the Equality Impact Assessment, which colleagues in the council dread because they all seem like they're, they're a major um, technical bit of work. Actually, all they are is a way of us demonstrating that we're thinking about people and the impacts when we are considering something or, or making decisions. Saying all that makes it sound very much like a legal compliance role, and it, but it isn't at all really. It, it's much more about influencing behaviour and, and helping to identify opportunities. The other side to the role is around engagement. Um, and I've had quite a bit of experience in different forms of engagement externally and, and inside the organisation. Um, so for example, several years ago now, we, we, um, we developed a co-production charter uh, amongst uh, people who were using adult social care services at the time to really look at ways and expectations that uh, services could work with individuals to, uh, to make changes. Um, one observation from this, and I think it'd be quite interesting if this sort of comes out in the discussion today, is often what we do isn't co-production. Um, it could be something else, and it often is something else, such as consultation or information giving or other, other ways of engaging people. And often if we intend to do co-production, it doesn't always end up that way um, in its purest form. So that's just sort of one uh, mission, uh, I suppose, for, from, from the outset. Um, the thing I wanted to quick touch on was a, as an example, and this is a very current example, which is around the, the adult social care strategy. That So we consulted on this towards the end of last year, September, between September and November, I think last year, on a, a range of principles and, uh, and priorities. And at the same time, we took the opportunity to look to recruit people to um, join some co-production working groups. So they got going in the new year and they're covering um, universal services and, and resilient communities, targeted help, um, including crisis support and reablement support. So people living at home who may need a bit of temporary support to continue to be independent at home and those who need um, more ongoing care over a longer period of time. So all three of those are adopting the principles of co-production, looking to work with a range of different people uh, and this will be people who may have a direct interest in social care, maybe a, a access support themselves or have a broader interest as a family member. There may be people who work in the field. Um, they could be elected members or, or other people. So those groups, and they're the first three, and there will be more to come, are, are sort of attempting to, to use the, uh, the co-production principles. So in giving that example, it's also a bit of a plug. And if uh, I I'd like to... Uh, promote that opportunity as well there's a we, we are looking to recruit more people to to get involved in, in that work hopefully that gives you a flavor of uh, of what i'm about and, and what i do thanks ed and good plug there at the end um if you're interested drop a note in the chat with your contact information um and last but not least over to you andy okay thanks Nick. um so andy wallace um, Commissioner in Mental Health for the local authority in the CTG. Um, we are part of an integrated team, which is quite a, a unique uh, situation to be in for a local authority, but we are quite proud of that. We are integrated with our CTG colleagues. Um, in regards to co-production, it's, it's a very hot topic at the moment for us in this integrated team. We've actually used co-create um, for several uh, opportunities to facilitate our thinking around how do we co-produce. Um, going on, to, on, on the back of what Ed was talking about in regards to equality impact assessments, I think when Ed was saying, yes, we are, we, 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 we do uh, 
sort of shaking dread when we've got a EIA to do. But Ed's been fantastic to support me along every time I've had to do an EIA. And one of the things about the importance of EIAs for us as a local authority, you have to get sort of formal sign off. Or if, if you're doing any tenders or if, you, if you're taking anything out to uh, contract, so you're asking the, the, you're asking the sector to bid for work, you've got to have a, a fully formed EIA signed off or you can't go any further. So that's how important they are to us. And I think that's where our opportunities are in the local authorities to use the EIA to enable us to understand if co-production is used and in what format. And if you're sort of saying, no, I'm not using, I'm not using co-production for this, you've got to put a, a really, really good explanation of the reason why you're not. And I think that will prompt services across the local authority to consider the importance of uh, co-production. But what you've also got to understand is the the depth and, and the width of what services we offer, where co-production may not be uh, the go-to. For example, anything around statutory law. You know, we can't be we can't be co-producing about law and. If we've got to do something, we've got to do something. So, and that's that has to be a given. But the things where we we can actually use the local, uh, use the public, that is going to be fantastic because it gives us that that uh, it gives us that depth and it gives us that sort of um, um, ability to build on service that public that the public have been involved in. And I'll give you an example before I finish. Uh, one of the things I recently commissioned was for something called the uh, Psychiatric Decisions Unit, which is at the Northern General Hospital. And an element of that is called the listening service. And that's, we wanted, at the time, we were thinking, do we need a faith-based service in there? So anybody who's, who has a faith, who wants support with their mental health, if they've gone to a and &E in crisis, can they go somewhere to talk to somebody about their faith and how that could help them? But anyway, that was deemed that it wasn't appropriate um, because I talked, I talked to the, the people receiving service. So what I did is brought a group of, of uh, users together. And this wasn't just your standard uh, users from services like Sunrise or Health Watch or, or you know, the voluntary, um, voluntary sector. I actually delve deeper and talk to people in, in care homes, talk to people receiving service through our recovery framework. And I got a group of about, about 17 people in a room and we had a whole day, fantastic day, using, using co-creates tools around co-production. And they actually wrote the job specification for the listening service. And it was their words. And all I had to do is make it sound like it were council that was it, but it were their words. So uh, everything in that JD, that's what they wanted from the service provider. And we actually got a service provider to, to deliver on that, that programme. And just to give you an understanding of, of, of what that's all around, it's whenever anybody is who's acutely unwell and have arrived at A&E, instead of them sitting in A&E, they can go along to the uh, psychiatric decision unit where it's calmer, it's a nice, I suppose, a nicer environment for them. But who knows how it feels when somebody is acutely unwell? You don't know what, what the environment must feel like. But the idea is that they can talk to people and that person would do some hand-holding and uh, some, you know, signposting and helping them along and making sure that that time period being waiting for to be assessed is a nicer experience. So I, I felt that was a great piece of co-production. And what we are trying to achieve now and this is why today is so good for us, is to get some idea of where are our barriers, but what are our can-dos? What can we do? How can we move it forward? Because we shouldn't see it as a, as a barrier. We should see it as something that we've got to embrace. Because like my partner said today, well, it's like us buying a kitchen and somebody buying it for us and saying, right, here's your kitchen. And I think that's a great analogy. I think, yeah, that's great. Why would you have somebody else buy you something? when you're buying into that service. So just, just leave you with that thought. And that's me, Dundee. Thanks, Andy. Um, thank you to everyone for that. So I think there was some really good um, 
introductions there and I think um, Ed and Andy have already started to give um, some examples of, of co-production work so that's my first question really and, and maybe I'll go to San, Sandy and um, Alice as well um, just around how have you seen co-production work in the public sector and what were the key things that enabled that co-production to, to, to happen um, Alice, do you have? Yeah. Um, so one of the um, uh, best examples, I think, is, is really about um, the move to digital services that many, um, many different um, services are having to, whether it's health, um, uh, education, employment, um, uh, both at a local and a, um, a, a national level. And I think there's been more and more awareness that introducing a digital service without taking more of a user-led co-production approach actually means that there are less there's less likelihood that the people who most need that service um, are, are going to benefit from it so one of the good examples i have is for a number of years we worked with um, nhs digital and ran the national um, program uh, widening digital participation and this was really looking at a variety of different health services that were um, uh, designed and, uh, to support different groups. So people um, with poor mental health, um, um, older people, people with learning disabilities, people living with Alzheimer's. And it was really about kind of a cross sector exchange. So I think the first principle I would say is it's about the diversity of voices that you have in that co-production. So you need to obviously have the commissioners of the service and you need to have that kind of um, public um, uh, uh, sector representation. But it's also really important to have the community sector involved to be able to have people support groups, to be able to have people with lived experience, because those voices are, will also pick up early on the challenges that from um, a sector provider position you may not necessarily see. So the Widening Digital Participation Programme has been brilliant in terms of trialling different techniques, working um, with different people in different ways, because I think that's the other thing for us around co-production. It has to, again, it's about different methods of engagement that are accessible to different people. Um, and I suppose I would just, um, with, the, uh, with the acceleration at which many services are going online, co-production is such a key space. If we want to get this right now, this is the time to really use it. Thank you, Al. Um, Sandy? Yep, thank you. Um, so I'll answer generally and then I'll give a, a couple of ideas, but happy to um, talk um, a bit more if needed. So I think for the public sector, there's a lot of mandated requirements. So we, we, we actually get a mandate, we get a, um, a plan that we then need to deliver. And I, I think um, that tells us what we need to deliver. How we deliver that is where I, I feel the co-production element um, can really, really sort of play out and come in. So we do feel quite constrained, if I'm honest, by all of the you know, must-dos that are required. Um, but, but then we seek to do that um, differently and to do that in, in partnership with, with either different organisations or communities or individuals and, and our patients. Um, so what are the barriers to that? One of the key things for me is around just resource to deliver it and expertise. So it's a capacity and capability element. In, in Sheffield Teaching Hospitals, we're really lucky in that we have a strong organisational development team, which is our service improvement team. Um, a number of coaches who have then trained other coaches across the organisation that help us to deliver um, various programmes. And if people are interested, this is, a, this is where I've got all my crib um, sheets from. On our public board papers from this week, there's um, developing our organisation annual report, which gives all the examples of things we've done um, across the organisation, particularly during the, the pandemic. Um, that, that link to the way we've worked differently, but also co-production. Um, and I, if I just sort of give a quick example around equalities impact assessment, I've got some other examples, but I can come on to. So um, during the pandemic, we recognised that equality impact assessments were essential, but actually people were just overwhelmed. We had to make some decisions really quickly 
but doing a, a, a temp a sheet just just didn't didn't um, well just didn't get done if I'm honest. Um, so we we um, developed almost a rapid quality impact assessment that helped um, to then guide our decision making during the pandemic, and we use that for um, visiting guidance. Um, for our shielding policy, for how we rolled out the vaccination program for people that know Sheffield, we, we run the um, hub at the um, Sheffield Arena for the mass vaccination um, program. So some some really really difficult decisions. So, for example, if we were asking patients to shield for two weeks prior to coming in to an operate for an operation, how how could we ensure? that um, different groups of individuals, different sec sectors, different communities weren't unfairly disadvantaged by applying that policy. And we recognise that policy will be easier to apply for some communities and others and, and, um, and, and um, various individuals with protected characteristics, if I'm honest. Um, so we spent a lot of time sort of challenging our thinking around, you know, the safety for our patients and our staff, but also, um, how the application of our rules as, as they were, because uh, you know, national rules, et cetera, then impacted on in individuals in, in, um, in the community. So, um, so I, just very quickly, I, the rapid um, quality impact assessment helped to sort of um, guide that decision-making thinking and, and then helped to just for us to then think around the impact. And I suppose co-production is, is, is there as well in that we tested out that thinking, but it was quite a challenging time in that some of those decisions had to be made at pace um, without the normal um, consultation and without the normal engagement that you would, would undertake for, for such decision-making. So I'm going to pause there and I can come back to any other different ideas. Thank Thanks, you. Andy. There were some really um, helpful um, examples there. Um, Ed um, or Andy, is there anything that you want to add on to there around some particular, you know, particular examples that you want to share of um, of how you've delivered co-production? I know you've given some already, so it's just if you want to add anything, Ed. Um, well, no, nothing. Um, nothing specific. I think, as I was sort of suggesting before, I think um, a lot of stuff seems to me that we've done. Um, you might not call it co-production in its pure sense, or you might describe it as sort of elements of co-production or um, uh, approaches where you are looking to involve um, people at an early stage and, and get views. So there's been quite a few um, examples around adult social care. So, for example, um, we've got a service called the uh, Adult Social Care Account Service, which uh, they might not, probably not the most popular service in the council. They're the ones who deal with your payments uh your contribution to the cost of social care or but they you know that um and that side of things but it was co-produced and, the, and the, the the notion of the service and how it evolved and what the roles were was something that that directly involved people um so that was that was one area it it does seem to me that um often um i suppose i tend to think of co-production as something where it's a, it's a blank sheet of paper so it's almost like well what what is it that that we might need here you know we're not we're not even saying it's it, we, we haven't defined what we want we're not saying it's a service it could be something else let's start from scratch and i suppose so often of course we don't or we can't start at that point we're some way down the line already um personally i'm i'm uh, i'm quite relaxed about that I, I i do i would understand that there would be lots of people who say well that isn't that isn't co-production you know that that's not you know you shouldn't you shouldn't call it that but i think the reality is often that um we're not unfortunately in that position to to say if we could do something what should we do as much as we'd like to um sandy was mentioning resource i think and i, I absolutely agree that that is an issue and i think almost one of the most important resources is is time um and it's not it's not only about money or having people to commit to to an activity it's having the lead in time to plan, um, involve people in the right way at the early stage, um, evaluate, reach a decision and, and, and all that sort of thing. And I think that's just one of the, the observations we've got. But I am, perhaps as this discussion sort of evolves, I'm more optimistic that we can do more in, in, that, in that area now. I think it's, it does feel to be, um, there's more appetite, I think, at this moment in time around co-production, uh, which I think is really welcome. 
Thanks, um, Ed. I'm, I'm just going to add a question onto that and then I might come to um, Andy with that question. But I think something that um, I've heard through the discussion and that I've experienced with co-production is around power sharing, um, power sharing across um, organisations, but also then that kind of power sharing um, with, um, with people who um, are involved in the design and delivery of service, the citizens that will use them. So I just wonder if anyone wants to kind of talk about, it's a challenge, isn't it? Like we can say that we want to do it, but when, when it comes down to it, I think especially Ed, a little bit like what you were saying, when, when it's an existing service maybe, and you're wanting to make changes to that existing service, I think it's lovely when it's completely new because you've got a blank sheet of paper, but at the times you don't have a blank sheet of paper, how do you, um, yeah, how do you go about that power sharing with um, with partner organisations and um, with the people um, that you're co-producing with? Andy? I think in to answer to that, it's, it's, um, Vic, it's really, it's really tough because that's one of the one of the challenges and one of the barriers we've come up against on many occasions, and it's usually you know the uh, the RT systems about sharing same systems that can be a challenge. But equally, when you're looking at people like the local authority, where we are responsible for the public, and we have nominated individual cabinet members and then a, a cabinet, that's all. That's tricky one to sort of overcome because again that's something that local authorities have to do um, but equally thinking differently about uh, the richness and the opportunities and that sense of ownership that it gives to people when they feel that they've been part of something um, a bit like expert by experience type roles where people can actually say yeah I can I can offer my advice to this and then Obviously, somebody's there to guide them around the candles because I think what we've got to try and get away from is what are the barriers? You know, we've got to think about well, what are the opportunities? Where, where can we where can we think of testing this, making sure that we can do it, but understanding where we've got barriers around, like I said earlier, around statutory requirements that. You know, we have as a local authority, the NHS would have, you know, those sorts of things where we've got to be really aware that we can't make changes because it's statutory, it's law, it's it's what 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 is. But where we can make changes, let's look at those opportunities to to give that co-production offer over as part of the deal that it has been co-produced and it's been done in a in a in the right and the right way and not just been a tick box, which Ed has been referencing that sometimes we've said, yeah, it's co-production, but it ain't. It's it's literally we've consulted a few people and they've said no. Or we've put something out to the wider public and we've probably had 20% return, but we've used that because that's what we've got back. Um, and that's fine because we've put it out to the public, we've put it out to the domain, but it's about understanding where those where those opportunities are for us to work with the public and work with the public that's that want to be involved because not everybody wants to be involved some people just want things done they want to know that the rubbish has been picked up or you know that they can get to hospital or you know whatever but other people really want to be involved in in how that happens and i think if we understand that from a strategic level that we can then say yes we do need to involve people here because it's about the public and it's about the services what we're delivering then fair enough and i've just realized i'm doing this a lot with my hands i'm a bit donald trump piano doing all that all this and i don't mean to be so i'm so sorry because i'm not a donald trump fan i didn't want to say andy but I'm kidding. <laughs> Thanks for that, Andy. Um, we've had a question from Anna. So the, the questions have started. So if that just helps other people to ask a question, then um, the yeah, the tap is on for questions from, from the group. So I'm going to um to, to ask um some of the questions that Anna has posed. Um, so one of the questions is she's curious whether the participants in the co-production um 
that um, different organisations do, a rem I've struggled with this word, remunerated for their time and expertise. Um, and I think, you know, that ties into something around kind of um, ethics of co-production as well. And the idea that, you know, done badly, it can just be kind of taking um, skills, expertise, lived experience, but not actually then kind of giving that back. So, um, Alice, you answered in the panel, so can I just come to you for the experience at Good Things first? Yeah, um, there's a couple of examples. So one is um, we were working up in Sunderland, actually, on um, an employability, a digital employability programme. So Sunderland is an area which has um, really high levels of unemployment and also low levels of people really engaged in doing further learning. And it's it, it's kind of a vicious cycle because people feel very demotivated with the lack of jobs, um, but there's a real need also to learn digital skills where actually that's a big part of the future of work now for most of us. Um, so it was really critical actually that we took a co-production approach up there to, to build a kind of employability programme that would gonna work for the local community. Um, and one of the things we did in terms of that was that we identified um, a, a kind of key local organization who had those trusted relationships with people who were coming for job clubs um, uh, in the local community. And what we offered was a kind of peer research program where they learned skills as part of the program and were heavily involved in the development of local campaigns and tailored employability programs, looking at everything from language to billboards to awareness raising to the kind of content. And this was really, really key because then it meant from start to finish, it was something that there was local buy-in about um, and uptake of. So that was a really, really good um, uh, experience in terms of also we we did re we did remunerate. I'm going to have problems with that word as well, Vic. But one of the challenges we had was a lot of people were on benefits, so we didn't want to, that to be affected. So it was about um, uh, development grants that they could then use to buy their own IT equipment or enroll on another further learning course or buy a suit for an interview. And that was all wrapped up around the focus was on employability and that was why the people were there in the first place. So there was a hook originally for them. And I'll just give another very recent example. We're currently working with um, DCMS, the Department for um, uh, Digital Culture, Media and Sport on um, a, a program getting 5,000 devices, connectivity and support out to people with learning disabilities around the country. And again, that has been a program where we're looking to involve people with learning disabilities to also be researchers to talk with beneficiaries of that project and with DCMS about the importance of that device in people's inclusion and what it's gone on um, to help them achieve. And that's been really important. And I would say it's about trust. Co-production is something where if you're buying into that, it's because you want to develop trusting relationships so that you really understand the place that your service has and how you can develop it to meet people's needs. That's great, Al, thank you. Um, Sandy, is there anything you want to add on that question? No, I'm in, I'm in awe of that. So, so basically we don't remunerate um, our colleagues, uh, you know, patients or carers that are involved. We, we would um, meet sort of expenses, but nothing, nothing broad as, as, as um, Alice has described, unfortunately. And, I, and I, I suspect that's probably pretty similar across most public sector organisations. But I, I, I stand to be challenged and corrected on that. Um. Andy or Ed, is there anything you want to add on the remuneration? Yeah, I can come in. Yeah, I mean, I think I think speaking quite honestly, and I, I probably should have said at the start, actually, I can't I can't speak on behalf of the council. I can give a, a perspective from my part of the council. Um, but it is fair to say, I think I'm not sure we, if I'm honest, we had a completely consistent position in the local authority around remuneration. It's certainly something that has been talked about over many years and has happened. So a little bit like Al was saying, um, payment in kind tended to be the way forward through vouchers, for example. Um, we also, for a time, had a contract with uh, Citizens Advice. So when we were working with people, we would invite them 
uh, to seek an appointment with citizens' advice for a check for the implications of receiving any payment, um, which obviously didn't have to take that 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 up, but it was there then as a, as an officer. Certainly, that was in place for a while. But I do know that this was part of um, the council's overall engagement um, standards, and that is currently being looked at and reworked as we speak. So it may well be that remuneration comes out of that. But it, I mean, I think as perhaps we're all suggesting, or maybe, maybe only Al's the one who's, who's cracked this one. Um, it is a really tricky area uh, to, um, to to really get to get right. So it is something we need to, we do need to look at. Thanks, Ed. And, and just, um, I'm going to be slightly cheeky and as facilitator, just um, share our experience on Age Better in Sheffield. Um, we've had a number of um, different people help us to um, co-design, co-govern um, and co-evaluate the programme. And actually, I think our approach has been very much about working with that individual or that group of individuals about working out what the best offer is for them. So whether that's things like covering expenses, providing providing tech equipment. So we've got some people who sit on our core partnership board. They've always had the same um, tech offer as our staff have because they are absolutely part of um, delivering that programme um, on, on behalf of South Yorkshire Housing Association. So they will have name badges, they will have the tech and the, and the expenses. Um, similar to, to Alice, um, I had an experience recently with a peer mentorship programme where we were looking to, um, to offer a payment, but actually that person was on benefits and they they didn't want to affect that yet they really wanted more the investment in development training interview coaching um etc so i think what we try to do and it's it's probably not kind of set out as an approach but what we tend to do with any new um service or um piece of co-production work we do we'll work out what that offer looks like from a kind of um range of of different resources really um, I, I, I was going to move on and I'm going to I was going to move to you, Andy, because Heather asked a question about um, your experience with co-create and what that looked and felt like. Um, I think you've answered in the chat. My chat's gone a bit funny, but do you want to just give a quick overview about that? Yeah, I think, and, and just to just to sort of, uh, um, modify on what, what you were talking about earlier, Vic, the thing around innovation and all, you know, development of things like this. Uh, places like South Yorkshire Housing Association, I'm going to sit on my hands, um, things like South Yorkshire Housing Association and places like that and, you know, Good Things Foundation, brilliant, absolutely amazing. Let's go to people who actually know what they're doing in regards to, we, we, we don't have central budgets in the local authority. Um, so when it comes to, you know, paying for things or paying for people, you're paying out of individual budgets and for all that, you know, the public might think we do have to save millions upon millions of pounds each year. And we've lost a lot of the workforce over the last 10, 15 years. Um, so we're doing, doing work very differently, but equally post COVID, I think the workforce is gonna look very, very different. And I think the workplace is gonna look very different in regards to that digital offer that um, uh, Al were talking about earlier. So when we um, when we look at things in regards to uh, co-production and co-create, for example, amazing because they were able to give us the tools, they were able to give us the direction, and they were facilitating in an extremely, you know, efficient and professional way. So co-create for us were the go-to because they, they were they were renowned and well known for getting those sorts of things being able to done. So it shapes your thinking. So they will give you a, a, an opportunity to, to discuss and they will actually challenge your thinking if you're going down the wrong path, they'll say, oh no, 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 that's not what you, this is how you, and not telling you what, but putting you on the right path. And then by the end of your session, you've come out with like a, 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 a uh, you know a way forward and I think co-create for us has been really really beneficial and um, equally what I said to Heather around um, Oxford City Council they were and I think it was through co-create that I got to know about Oxford and what they're doing Oxford County Council I should say um, and they've got a co-production team they've got 
offices it's going to be part of job descriptions for any jobs in the local authority uh, in their county council authority um so it, it means that people have got to be involved so if you're going to work for them you've got to not understand co-production but you've got to get on board with it i suppose that that's what it means and i think they they give you a real flavor of how it can work in a really beneficial way and clearly they're a different demographic oxford's a smaller city than most bigger cities so sheffield or leeds or manchester might struggle but smaller places they can really prove that it can work but you can evolve and you can you can make it work but co-create for us was a real a real benefit because it shaped our thinking and put us on a path about where we need to go thanks sandy that's great and um just do check out the the chat um anna's put in um about the involve framework and um vicky's referenced um the co-production collective as well so some really good places um to, to get more around um that um so we've touched on it um a, a little bit but I, I i wanted to just kind of um talk a little bit about um covid um and I suppose my question, the, the question that I have is, it sounds like, um, you know, it's been a game changer. We all know that for, for, for good and for not so good in many ways. But I just wonder, um, what's your experience from a co-production point being? Have you been able to reach different audiences than you normally would? But also on the flip side, who's still missing or who might be missing out more um, as a result of um, this move to doing things more digitally. Um, can I come to you, Sandy? Or do you want a couple of minutes? Yeah, there was a number of questions there. Just Another ask the final question yeah. again. <laughs> yeah, so who um, who have you been able to reach out to that you haven't been able to previously, yeah. but who might you be missing, um, you know, missing yeah. out more because of that move to going yeah. online? Yeah. So, so I think um, Alice put this perfectly about the digital inclusion agenda and it's really stark. And I think if anything, the pandemic um, has heightened a number of inequalities. So we, you know, where you've got, you, where you previously had inefficiencies in the system, the pandemic has only, only served to, to um, broaden almost the gap. Um, and then for us, we're finding that plays out with uh, both our staff and the communities we serve. So we, we have 18,000 staff, but we have a significant number of those individuals who, who never access a computer and don't, don't either use or have an email address. And then we're, we're trying to do everything um, electronically. All of our comms over the last years, has, you know, some of it has been really urgent communications around you need to wear different PPE now, you need to be doing this, because that changed throughout the year. Actually, you know, clearly recognising that email is not the only way of communicating and, and you know, jumping through that, that hoop of um, recognising that, that um, many of our staff are digitally excluded. It is something that we've, we quite clearly, we still haven't got right. We still know there are pockets of individuals that, um, we're not reaching and, and that plays out in our staff survey and we see the response rates are different in different um, sex, um, sections of the organisation. Um, just, just in terms of, I suppose, opportunities that it, um, COVID has given us for working with our um, patients, we've just at the back, on the back of COVID, we've created a, um, almost a long COVID um, programme. So post COVID-19, pathway almost in terms of for individuals who have long COVID, um, how do they appropriately access service? And what we were finding is um, those individuals were potentially bouncing around a number of different services across the trust because they had um, variable um, needs that weren't met by any one area. We, we brought brought those, um, those needs together and we have like a um, a patient voice group that helps to drive um, how those services deliver. So we, you know, almost putting the patients at the heart of of, of um, creating a completely new service. So a bit, a bit like Sir Andy and Ed said, it, it's very rare that you're actually creating a completely new service. And this is one of those very few occasions where we we have created a long COVID um, service, but that was driven by um, patient 
need who probably were more vociferous on social media before we actually got to delivering what they needed, if I'm honest. There's a lot, lot of um, social media groups. Um, and, and then I, I suppose in terms of co-production for COVID, just another example that I've, I've got is around, we had to make a really, um, or we were told to make a really tough decision about stopping visiting um, in the organisation. And I think that, you know, I, that has had significant reper repercussions in terms of patient journeys, but also carer experience of, um, of our organisation. So, um, with the support of our charity, we created sort of care bags. So if you suddenly um, admitted into hospital, normally you go like, bring my toothbrush, I need, I need my dressing gown, I need that. Well, actually all of that can easily be facilitated. Um, so um, our sort of, we had a health, we set up quite quickly a health and wellbeing team that facilitated that interface between the families and our patients. Um, they delivered letters that were publicly clean. They printed off photos so people were able to email in photographs and they printed those off so they could be on, on the walls for our patients. And they created sort of care bags. But all of that evolved through um, patient and care experience feedback. So, you know, actually we need this in the bag, we need to do that. And, and just some of the numbers, we um, delivered nearly 5,000 care bags, about 40,000 different items in, whether that's face cream or toothbrush. But it evolved very quickly, and it was it was driven by the need um, of, of individuals in in that situation. So that for me is a great example of co-producing something that meet, meets an immediate and, and quite new need. So I think COVID has given us all sorts of um, different areas there. And I'm just going to sum up really quickly whilst I've got the floor. So you know what are the opportunities of dig digital opportunities are massive, but there's also um, massive. Um, pitfalls in that, as, as Alice has explained. But also I think um, what I've observed and, and um, seen is a, um, a, a greater desire to be sort of caring and compassionate. And I, I get a feeling that plays out across all services around actually, we've, we've been through a really difficult experience and I've seen where we've not got that right. Um, and, and it's really hard to hear and read those stories. Um, but that caring and compassion should now drive us to really be listening and thinking and acting differently, on, on, whether that's on behalf of communities or individuals. Um, and, and definitely I see that playing out more, more across the services that I observe. So I'm going to pause there and hand over. That, that's great, Sandy. I, I really enjoyed um, listening to that. And I really liked um, just the openness and honesty of that, that reflection as well. So thank you for that. Alice, do you have anything to add? I could add a lot. I could probably talk all day on this. Um, so in a kind of quick summary, um, we, we knew a lot about digital inclusion, but our understanding and the work of all of our community partners so we work with about um, a network of thousands of community partners called online centers up and down the country and we understood about the model of, of those centers supporting people but it was all based on face-to-face -face. Um, and being leading research at good things foundation one of the things i found was like everywhere else we stopped being able to do have any of that face-to-face -face contact but we needed very quickly during the pandemic to learn about people's needs and to learn about how they wanted to receive a service um, and what, um, you know, what priorities, just as Sandy was saying, what was the priority for them? So I suppose just a few immediate takeaways was that we, even as a charity, didn't appreciate the impact of, of lack of personal digital access for so many people. Um, it, for our own staff, um, we all moved to working remotely and at home, so we all needed digital access, but it was community partners who really um, were kind of doing everything for their best will, but didn't have devices to give out to people or didn't have devices for staff and volunteers. Um, so I suppose one of the things we've had to do is find, and we've co-produced kind of remote um, a set of remote resources about how you how you provide support, how you connect with people, how you deliver sessions, and co-producing those was really important because just as Sandy was saying, actually it moved away from our, our kind of digital skills focus to being around um, supporting people with 
ensuring they weren't lonely and isolated, um, ensuring they got medicines, ensuring they had food. Um, and I think now post COVID, actually what we've realized is there is a, there's an opportunity with the stuff that we've done during that co-production period to have a remote um, and, and digital offer, but it has to be alongside multi-channel and blended support. Um, and that's something that we are now heavily advocating also for with government and around different services, because whilst we've had a necessity to do digital, actually the need now is for, for multiple options and to be really person-centered because we're all going on a recovery journey. Thanks, Al. That's great. Um, we are two minutes away from finishing. We're not going to go over. And Vicky wants 30 seconds to talk about the network and NATA, which is a continuation of this. So I'm going to go to um, Ed and say, have you got a, any kind of 30 second summary or reflection? I have. It's been a great discussion. I've really enjoyed it. I think um, to some extent, I'm thinking about, oh, you know, the, the obstacles and the challenges, but also it's, I also want to put a positive note out in the sense of, yes, there are challenges to really embed in co-production. However, I think the time is really good for this. Speaking about the council, um, in no particular order, we've got some, we've got new, a new chief exec in the council, new leadership in the council, some very, very strong, positive messages around involving and empowering people, uh, which is a real step change. So I think it, there's a strong appetite um, emerging. We're also due to move to a local area committees as a way of engaging people. So it's it's a huge journey, right, and personally right, right at the start of that journey. But I think there will be opportunities there to engage people in different ways, in the in face to face ways, but also digitally. The other thing I'll just quickly plug is well, not plug, but just flag really. It's uh, the the local government association. Uh, they published something a few years ago called the local called New Conversations, which is something I refer to quite a lot. It's a really, really good uh, area of good practice about how councils can and should find different ways to engage people in a in a changing environment, one where trust is at a premium and there, there's lots of different issues. So there are some good resources there that we can that we can uh, lean on. So sort of in summary, lots to do, but I do think the council is is in a good place to uh, to take this forward. Thanks, Ed. And maybe 20 seconds, Andy. It's a ditto to what Ed said, absolutely. And he's Great. bang on with what he said. So, yeah, and I've got some stuff which I've put in chat, but I'll send it to Vicky. Perfect. Well, that's it. Um, I could honestly do at least another hour of this, maybe two, but we've come to the end of the session. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to, to Vicky for um, a quick 10 second summary, but really um, just want to say a huge thank you to um, our four panellists. You've been brilliant, open, honest and very interesting. Um, and we hope to engage with you again soon. So and thank you to everyone for, for coming along. Thanks so much, Vic, and thanks again to everybody that's in the session and to the panellists as well. Um, so there is opportunity to carry on conversations at the Network and NATA session tomorrow um, afternoon. I've put the link in the chat. Um, it is on Eventbrite as well. So if you did want to come along to that, you're more than welcome. I think it's a good opportunity to, to carry on these conversations, but also to kind of reflect on, on what you've learned from, from what you've heard and where you can take that going forward. So. Uh, so please do come along if uh, if you're free and available. And uh, yeah, I guess that's it. We better wrap up now because we're yeah. Fine. Thank you, everyone. I'll be at the network and that so hopefully see some of you there tomorrow. Thanks so much for your time and have a good rest of the afternoon. Bye bye. Take care, everyone. Bye.